This is an online version of a paper that I gave at a conference in February 2022. That in turn was a reframed version of some research that I partially published on my website, Kiwi Hellenist, in the second half of 2021. Uh, you can look at the comments below for uh, below the video for details. So the dates of Jesus. I should uh, note in advance that I'm not trying to actually recover the dates of Jesus here. Um, we don't have the data for that. What I'm looking at here is what ancient Christians believed and what they claimed about the dates of Jesus. When you look at the dates that are given for Jesus in modern sources, encyclopedias and the like, and you compare them to what you find in ancient evidence, there are some striking discrepancies. Uh, but I've always found it difficult to get an overview of what the ancient evidence actually is. Um, in modern scholarship, there are plenty of discursive analyses of Jesus' dates out there, but there are no compilations of, uh, of just the primary evidence. So last year, I started compiling it myself. I have compiled 39 distinct testimonia, which you can see here, from 20 different authors. They range from the Gospels in the, New, in the New Testament up to Epiphanius in the late 300s. What I found showed some striking trends, and I haven't been able to find anyone else talking about them, so I will now. Early Christians don't seem to have taken a huge amount of interest in the dates of Jesus' life, when he was born, when he died, and so on. The when I say early Christians, I mean the very earliest Christians. The canonical Gospels have some details, but other early sources from the first two centuries have very little to add. We get some chronological markers in the infancy narratives in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Uh, but the passage that early sources refer to the most is in Luke chapter 3. Uh, so the infancy narratives, you've got the um, the opening chapters of Matthew and Luke. Uh, Luke chapter 3 is the one you can see listed here as T9, Testimonium 9. Uh, that chapter talks about the start of the ministry, uh, sorry, the, the, yeah, the start of the ministry of John the Baptist in the 15th year of Tiberius's reign, Jesus's baptism and the start of his ministry, and it states that Jesus was 30 at the time. Now, in principle, you could maintain there were intervals of time between these events. But ancient sources don't do that. They're happy to take all of these events as happening together the same year. Here's how Justin Martyr in the 150s uh, reports Jesus' date. He refers to the teacher we have for these things, who was born for this function, Jesus Christ, and who was crucified under the rule of Pontius Pilate in Judea at the time of Tiberius Caesar. Fine. But very vague. Uh, the Pontius Pilate reference matches the Gospels. The reference to Tiberius comes from Luke 3. And the other three sources that we have from the 1st and 2nd centuries are just as vague as this one. Uh, Josephus. Uh, the Josephus passage has major textual problems. It's the Testimonium Flavianum. But corrupt as it is, it's just as vague. Uh, there's also Tacitus, equally vague. Just Pilate and Tiberius over and over again, and repeatedly in Irenaeus. Irenaeus, uh, although he refers to Tiberius's reign repeatedly, unlike the others, he thinks Jesus didn't die until Claudius's reign, nearly 20 years later. Still, it's pretty clear that for all of these, the most important chronological marker is the one in Luke 3. Irenaeus is especially emphatic about putting Jesus in a specific historical context, his point would be enormously strengthened if he could add greater precision, but he can't. We do see some evidence uh, of people in the first, in the, in the second century looking for more precision. Uh, Irenaeus tells us about the Valentinian sect, uh, that whom he regarded as heretical. The Valentinians thought Jesus' ministry lasted precisely 12 months, one month for each apostle. Now, that idea uh, died out with the Valentinians, but the idea of this kind of precision sets the tone for later developments. Just a few years after Irenaeus, we get Clement of Alexandria weighing up exact dates for Jesus' birth. He, he's got a whole bunch of dates that he quotes uh, his, for Jesus' birth, baptism, and death, and the dates that he reports are precise to the day. What happened? 
Where did these dates come from? Well, um, that's what I'm going to be talking about. We get a bunch of very specific dates in later sources as well. So Jesus was born on the 25th of December, 2 BCE, or on the 28th of March, or the 6th of January. He was baptized in 28 CE on the 6th or the 10th of January or the 8th of November, and he died in 29 CE on the 25th of March or the 23rd, or in 30 CE or in 32 CE. You, you, there's a whole bunch of variations. So the, the most precise dates are the ones in Clement of Alexandria, Hippolytus of Rome, the De Pasca Computus, written, written in 243, the chronography of 354, which isn't shown here, and uh, Epiphanius. Well, so ancient uh, readers took Luke 3 as saying that Jesus' ministry began in the year Tiberius 15. What year was that? Well, Tiberius's reign began in August 14 CE, but his regnal year depends on what calendar you're using, and there were dozens of different calendars for expressing uh, day and month in the ancient Mediterranean, and there were just as many systems for expressing the calendar era, the, the year that an event happened. Well, the Romans had the Julian calendar, which sounds nice and clear, especially when you consider that we're still using a version of it today. But even within Rome, there were three distinct calendar era systems. There, you've got the consular year, um, referring to the who was consul that year, and, and that began that began in January. The, you've got the emperor's tribunician year, uh, which works the same way as a regnal year, but begins at the start of when the emperor assumes the tribunate. And you've got the ab urbe condita year, that is to say, um, from the foundation of the city of Rome, uh, using the date ca calculated by Varro, uh, AUC for short, but. AUC is very popular nowadays, but it was extremely rare in antiquity. Uh, pretty much the only use of AUC dates that we know of from the first century is in the Fasti Capitolini. They use AUC uh, for the Republican era, and then they switch to tribunician years, starting with Augustus uh, and his first tribunate in 23 BCE. And by ancient standards, this is tidy. Only three systems. In the Eastern Empire, you've got a whole bunch more. Um, a lot of places used the Emperor's Regnal Year, and that's what we get in Luke 3, Tiberius 15. Uh, but the Regnal Year starts at different times of year, depending on where you live. Um, uh, the, the usual practice was that the regnal year would begin at the time of the emperor's accession to the throne, and year two begins at the following new year in the local calendar. So for first century Judea, that most likely means the Antiochene calendar. Uh, in Antioch, the new year corresponded to the 1st of October in the Julian calendar. So when Luke says Tiberius 15, the most natural interpretation is that he's talking about the year that started on the 1st of October, 28 CE. When Clement starts giving precise dates, um, he's writing around the year 200, he uses the Alexandrian calendar. John Chrysostom uses the Antiochene calendar again. The chronography of 354 uses AUC dates. Eusebius uses Olympiads. Julius Africanus uses Anno Mundi, uh, dating from the year of the biblical creation. Well, translation between all of these different schemes produces haphazard results and inconsistencies. There are a couple of external chronolo uh, chronological markers that some people did try to use to pin things down a bit more precisely. One tactic was to take a passage in uh, the Hebrew Bible in Daniel chapter 9, which refers to a period of 70 weeks or hebdomads of years, uh, that is to say 490 years. And this uh, this passage is still popular among modern um, apologists of various brands, uh, and every enthusiast, both ancient and modern, has their own way of interpreting exactly what these 490 years represent, when they begin and when they end, and exactly where in the 490 years the Messiah is supposed to appear or die. For example, Tertullian. Uh, fudges the dates of various rulers, um, Achaemenids, Ptolemies, and the Roman emperors, to, so as to get to the Jewish war in 70 CE, 
um, because he knows when that's supposed to have happened, and so he, he has that as the end of his 490 year period. Uh, and as a side effect, that produces uh, dates for Jesus as well. Uh, Julius Africanus uh, treats the 490 years as Hebrew lunar years, and then he converts that to 475 solar years. It's not really surprising that the different methods produce inconsistent dates for Jesus. One passage in Josephus, a non-Christian writer, a Jewish writer, in uh, Jewish Antiquities, Book 13, uh, is apparently premised on identifying the Judean king Aristobulus II as the Messiah. And uh, apparently the, the idea is that the 481 year mark is supposed to have fallen at the start of his reign in 104 BCE. Nothing to do with Jesus, but it's just another example of how people were fudging this prophecy, both Jewish and Christian. Uh, a more directly relevant marker uh, for ancient Christians is a solar eclipse that supposedly took place at the time of Jesus' death. Now, the Gospels of Mark and Matthew state that the midday sky went dark for three hours during the crucifixion. Uh, Luke repeats this, and he adds that the darkness was a solar eclipse. And it was now around the sixth hour, he says, and darkness came over the whole earth until the ninth hour because of a solar eclipse. Uh, other sources attribute the eclipse interpretation to Thalos, whose dates are unknown. We can't be sure, as a result, whether Luke uh, got the idea from Thalos or Thalos got the idea from Luke. In the second century, this uh, idea of a solar eclipse at the, at the crucifixion was identified with a specific eclipse that was reported by a pagan author, Phlegon of Trales, who was active in Hadrian's reign. And later Christian writers differ over whether to accept the eclipse interpretation or not. Tertullian and Julius Africanus reject the eclipse, Origen and Eusebius accept it. But the reason they talk about it is because Phlegon apparently reported it as taking place in the consulship of Rubellius Geminus and Fufius Geminus, which was 29 CE. And that year also corresponds to Tiberius 15 in most reckonings. Now, the, the eclipse interpretation is definitely wrong uh, for many reasons. The only one I'll mention right now is that the, <laughs> the actual eclipse took place in November, and that puts it in the wrong Olympiad year. Still, it was evidently valuable in various quarters to have some corroboration for the 29 CE date. Why? Uh, if ancient readers were happy to accept that Luke 3 puts Jesus' ministry in 29 CE, why did they need additional corroboration? Well, the most likely reason is, um, is to do with a dispute over the, length, over the length of Jesus' ministry. Um, there was active controversy on this subject in the second century. And essentially it boils down to a long chronology of Jesus' ministry versus a short chronology, three years or more versus one year, uh, approximately. Uh, the Synoptic Gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, uh, mention one Passover in the course of Jesus' ministry, the, the one at which he was crucified. But the Gospel of John uh, mentions three Passovers. Now, modern apologists are generally happy to take it that the Synoptic, the synoptic Gospels just didn't happen to mention that years were passing. But for second century Christians, this was a significant problem. In the 180s, we get Irenaeus explicitly condemning the Valentinians because they thought Jesus' ministry lasted only one year. And when Irenaeus rejects them, he specifically draws on the Gospel of John, and he reports John's three Passovers, and he concludes that they imply a ministry of at least three years. In fact, he argues for more like 20 years, but that's, that's another subject. Conversely, Clement, when he's pinning down exact dates for Jesus, he cites the Gospel of Luke and only Luke. He gives the chronological markers from Luke chapters 1 to 3. He cites Luke's quotation of Isaiah about uh, the acceptable year of the Lord, but he doesn't mention the three Passovers in John 
and, and it isn't as if he, he, it's not like he's arguing against John. He, it's more like he's pretending John doesn't exist, or, or at least that bit of John, those bits of John, don't exist. So the position, the, the various positions taken here by the Valentinians, by Irenaeus, by Clement, taken together, these show pretty clearly that there was an active dispute over the length of Jesus' ministry. And this dispute was in the mid to late second century. And we can see echoes of this dispute in later chrono chronologies. Uh, when Julius Africanus uh, assigns Jesus' parousia to a date, he, he assigns it to a single year, implying the short chronology. Uh, the De Pasca Computus puts Jesus' death exactly a year after his baptism, but Hippolytus and Eusebius put his death three years afterwards, counting exclusively. Uh, Epiphanius makes it three years, counting inclusively. So there was no single accepted approach to this. And one result of this is that when ancient Christians come to assigning Jesus's birth date, we do get similar irregularities there as well. The one to three year variance that we get for his ministry shows up as a similar variance in his birth date. And it seems to me most likely that this is a result of people seeing the different death dates and subtracting anywhere from 30 to 34 years from that to find a birth date, depending on whether they prefer the long chronology or the short chronology. Uh, without noticing that the death dates already incorporate one of those, one chronology or the other. Um, Matthew and Luke, chapter 1, sorry, Matthew, chapters 1 and 2, and Luke, chapter 1, uh, they assign Jesus' birth to the year that we would call 4 BCE. In later sources, this date gradually drifts forwards in time, until it ends up in the year 1 BCE or 1 CE in 4th century sources. And I suggest that disputes over the chronology of his ministry is responsible for this drift. And I think we've got enough here to show uh, that uh, we've got enough here to show how the discrepancies in Jesus's dates arose. The remaining question is why? Why do we suddenly find people getting specific day and month dates for Jesus's birth and death? around the year 200, and why did Irenaeus and Clement care so much about the length of Jesus' ministry that they took such a polemical approach? Uh, in Irenaeus's case, rejecting the Valentinian position as heresy, and in Clement's case, covering up inconvenient evidence from the Gospel of John. Why are they so polemical? Why are they suddenly getting so specific when everyone in the first and second centuries it's all so vague, the dates are so vague there, and then around the year 200 we get these polemics and we get these very specific dates arising. Well, I suggest that the answer to both questions is that that's the period when, Christ when Christians began to need specific dates, and they needed those dates for a specific liturgical purpose, namely to settle the date when they should celebrate Easter, the resurrection of Christ. By the mid-second century, um, a disagreement had arisen between the Roman and Anatolian churches on this exact question. Anatolian, Christ Anatolian Christians, uh, with Polycarp as their spokesman, argued for using the date determined by Passover in the Hebrew calendar, namely the 14th day in the month of Nisan. Uh, Roman Christians argued that it should be celebrated on the Sunday, at a time more directly related to the equinoctial full moon. And this controversy is known as the Quartodecimon controversy, from the Latin for 14th. And we start to see this, this dispute arising in the 150s. Uh, Polycarp and the Pope um, in the 150s, they basically just agreed to disagree. But in the late second century, the dispute became uh, bitter. It arose again, and, and, it, and it got quite heated. Uh, and synods were convened at various locations all around the Mediterranean in the, in the 190s to try and settle the matter. Um, they didn't settle the matter, the dispute lingered on until the Council of Nicaea in 325. But what I'm suggesting is that it's the synods of the 190s that created the need for precise dates, exact to the day. In the decade on either side of that date is when we get Irenaeus and Clement making their cases for the long and the short chronologies, and it's immediately after 190, uh, the 190s, around the year 200, that we find Clement and Tertullian 
giving exact dates for Jesus' birth and death for the very first time in recorded history. Uh, Clement and Tertullian did not find these dates in older texts, um, and they didn't find them in any widely disseminated oral traditions. If they had, those texts and those tra traditions would have been known to Justin Martyr and Irenaeus. Uh, Irenaeus, in particular, would really have liked to have evidence to support his attack on the Valentinians, but he didn't have it. All he had was the Gospels. So it's in that context that we also find people drawing on the solar eclipse of 29 CE to corroborate Luke's dating of Jesus' ministry. And presumably, uh, the per one, another purpose of, of citing the, the solar eclipse is to, support the date, is to support the case for the short chronology. Uh, the eclipse puts Jesus' crucifixion in the same year as his baptism. Uh, Tertullian and Julius Africanus knew that the eclipse was a red herring, but people were talking about it in the context of dating Jesus. Uh, and even though they were disagreeing a bit with it, they knew that people had been talking about it. We don't get Christmas pinned to the 25th of December until Hippolytus a few decades later, but it's the controversy of the 190s that led to that date being pinned down. If the Quattrodecaman controversy hadn't happened, presumably our evidence for Jesus' dates would still be limited to what we find in Matthew and Luke. So th that was the end of the paper as I, pre as I presented it at the conference. And afterwards, there were some good questions in the Q&A. One question was whether Luke's eclipse uh, might be a, re a recollection of an authentic historical event. Well, it's a nice change to be able to definitely rule something out. We can be as sure as we can be about anything in Jesus' life that there was not a solar eclipse at his crucifixion. First, uh, of the three synoptic gospels, Luke is the latest, and while the earlier ones, both of his sources, Mark and Matthew, were um, reporting a three-hour darkness at the crucifixion, only Luke refers to it as a solar eclipse. Second, uh, Passover happens at uh, full moon. Uh, solar eclipses can only happen at new moon, when the moon is between the Earth and the Sun. Uh, and that is, in fact, the point that Julius Africanus draws on to when he's rejecting the eclipse interpretation. Third, uh, the 29 CE eclipse was at the wrong time of year. It was in November. Evidently, Phlegon um, of Trales didn't mention that in his report of the historical eclipse. Fourth, in a solar eclipse, totality only lasts a couple of minutes, not three hours. And fifth, um, this isn't very substantial in its own right, but it's worth pointing out anyway, ancient Christians didn't believe it. Um, Tertullian and Africanus, as I said, reject the eclipse interpretation. And also, from the 5th century onwards, most manuscripts of the Gospel of Luke actually change the text to remove the reference to an eclipse, indicating that the scribes who copied those, who made those manuscripts, um, they didn't believe it either. So they would want them to remove the error in Luke. And there are apologist tactics you can use to argue that Luke's report is based on something real, but those tactics aren't there in the ancient sources. Um, they're, they're not there in Mark or Matthew. The other big question asked um, at the conference was why Julius Africanus got into the business of drawing up a Christian chronography of all of history. I don't have a definite answer for that. I'm not a Julius Africanus expert, but I suspect that it is in part down to the same kind of impulse that we see in the Quattrodecaman controversy itself. When ancient Christians got interested in dates, that seems to have led to a more general interest. Remember, the third century is when we see Hippolytus drawing up his paschal tables and cross-referencing uh, equinoctial full moons to events in the Hebrew and Christian Bibles throughout all of history. Uh, the third century is when we see Anatolius producing a revised, a revised metonic cycle for calculating Easter. Chronological precision was the flavour of the century. Uh, why the Quattrodecaman controversy happened, though, uh, back in the second century, that is a bit more speculative. But I think it's probably fair to say that if precision was the flavour of the third century, numerology was the flavour of the second century. Uh, there's a lot of numerological symbolism floating around at that time, the numerology in Revelation, 
uh, interpretations of Daniel's 70-week prophecy, and especially the Valentinians. So, uh, there we have it. Those were the questions. That was the paper. Um, if you've made it this far, thanks for watching, and I hope we'll be seeing each other again before too long when I start putting other old conference papers online. Thanks, and goodbye.